Faith is feeling. We've always been taught that it is not feeling. But it is. Not the feeling of emotion, but the feeling of attitude. Faith is an attitude. Attitude is our real feeling toward God. It is our inner posture toward the existence of God and the claims of that existence. I have ventured to open my sermon like this because A.W. Tozer, Tozer once wrote as a definition of worship that worship is a feeling in the heart. And so I grew braver to say that faith is feeling. Faith is the most important attitude in one's life. Faith in God is a relationship that is central in focus and brooks no rivals. Thus Isaiah said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Now where am I going to get a text for something like this? I don't have any. And yet I do. Our text is really perceived from the silence of Scripture. Hmm. And it has to do with the time, I think it's found in fact in 1 Corinthians. It's not really the text, but the context is in 1 Corinthians 15. Remember all this while we've been studying the writings of James. And in 15, 7, part of the words, there could be, there's an A, B, and C to that part, so it's B. And this is only, this is only context because it's not, it's not the text for the scripture. He was seen of James. Now our text is in silence, but our text is what James said. What was James's attitude at that point? See, that's the context. This is, the words here are the context, so I couldn't give it as text. But I can give you a parallel text because there was someone else who I think probably was closest to James's position, at least at one point in his life. And he changed his mind on the spot when he saw that Jesus Christ had indeed been resurrected. That text, or that parallel text, I've never taught or sounded like this before in my life. I told Stephen, I said, Stephen, this is all me, I promise. That is, my presentation, the selection of content, and all that I've written is simply me. So if you don't like it, that's okay. If you don't like it, remember there's somebody, there's somebody else preaching in the land and they've got different materials. They have a different way. But this is all me, I assure you. I was looking over. I said, oh, Jesus, help me. That's me. All right. Never heard of a parallel text. I've even got a collaborating text. I have a silent text. I have context. I have a parallel text. And I have a collaborating text. But right now we're on... The parallel text, which I believe to, I believe gives us the sense of the context. Said he was seen of James. All right, parallel text. Found in John 20, beginning with 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless. Do not have this attitude, Thomas. 
but believe, but be believing. Thomas said, I'll not believe unless I see him for myself. So Jesus said, blessed are those that believe because they have seen, but more blessed are those who believe and have not seen. So Thomas now is confronted with the very sight of the risen Lord himself. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Well, that's a parallel text. Take yourself back. He was seen of James. James' attitude's been wrong. It's been an attitude of faithlessness, if you please. In spite of the fact that the perfect man was found in his own home, in spite of the fact that he lived with him some 30 years, day and night, who are you, O faithless man, that you should judge men who have walked with God and found them not to be, and yet they are? For most often the meek are overlooked. Ideas about religion that are really not true and thus renders us faithless. I don't know what he said, but he could have said this. My brother, and then, my Lord and my God. And the attitude of James was changed. Collaborating text, James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Collaborating. Faith is an attitude, the most important attitude in our entire life. Faith is actually a threefold attitude. Our attitude toward God, our attitude toward ourselves, and our attitude toward others others. In our attitude toward God, or if our attitude toward God is that of revelation, that is to really know that he is and he, that he exists, and we have the revelation of his majesty and his holiness, then our attitude toward ourselves is that of our nothingness. So faith is an attitude, you see, Oh, look at the influence on behavior. The attitude that God is everything from everlasting to everlasting, holy and majestic, and that we, because we do not have everlastingness, that is, from everlasting to everlasting, we are creatures of creation. And therefore, we owe all to him. We hold the existence of ourselves and we hold the sustenance of ourselves. And without that, we collapse. And therefore, in humility, we give our allegiance unto him and we say unto the Lord Jesus Christ who created us all as the agent of the Father, my Lord and my God. An attitude toward God of everythingness, an attitude toward ourselves as nothingness. I always have to clear up because my, I don't always have to clear up, but since I have a degree in psychology, I, I have to recognize that the damaged personality tends to misuse the scripture because he has not established his own self-worth. Uh, it, it is presumed in a message like this that psychologically we know our self-worth. That is, that it's there. It is not self-worth that, that I am concerned about with reference to nothingness and with reference to restraint and to denial. It is the self-assertiveness that has come through the fall. The idea that I can be the God of my own life and I owe nothing to my creator or to anyone else. That of course has to be denied and has to be eliminated. We don't know of what we are. Our attitude toward God and our attitude toward ourself I think is properly expressed when the psalmist said, Oh Lord, our Lord, 
How excellent is thy name in all the earth. And then he is found to say a few verses later, What is man that thou art mindful of him? In view of thy majesty, in view of the excellence of thy name, why are you mindful of man? And what is the son of man that thou visitest him? Threefold, not twofold. Him, ourselves, others. Now, the greatest test of our faith is found in our attitude toward others. Our love for God is and can be measured by our response to all other persons. And that's what the Beatitudes uh, confirm. In fact, the Beatitudes confirm the threefold attitude. Notice, he starts out with our attitude toward ourselves and our attitude toward God. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. They have the fullness of heaven's resources behind them. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's a big title. Blessed are the meek, those that have power under control, for they shall inherit the earth. Isn't it wonderful? I am tempted to preach on the Beatitudes. These thoughts come to my mind. Isn't it wonderful that when we keep our self-assertiveness down, we keep it eliminated and restrained, that we're the very ones that come to the fullness of our calling? We're the very ones that have on earth what God wants for us? For he says that he would withhold no good from them that walk uprightly. Everything we need will come to us. And he will cause all things to work together for good. For there's some very, there's some very hard things some very awful things that come to many and most lives. So the greatest test of our faith is found in our attitude toward others. And look, most all the Beatitudes have to do with uh, others. After he said, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, then he points toward others. Blessed are the merciful. Remember all these equivalent scriptures in James. James talks about these over and over again, almost parallels, the, indeed it does, parallels the teachings of Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And then, blessed are the pure. It's the way this next one could read. Blessed are the pure, for the pure is in the ones in which the light of God shines forth, and that's what's persecuted. And whenever you are persecuted for Christ's sake, there are great and wonderful rewards. James says, true faith is found in courtesy to all, compassion for all, and consistency with all. Specifically, true faith is found in a gracious tongue of society and by our retaining those values that are eternal, not temporary. And then Jesus tells us that the work of our faith toward others actually determines our destiny. Well, there's a great shock. See, now, we're, we may have been all right with the first one because we truly didn't understand it, we might have been all right with the second one because intellectually we may accept our nothingness. But now, friends, the test comes right here. And Jesus himself says at the judgment of the nations, he said, you did not clothe me, therefore depart from me. You did not visit me, therefore depart from me. You did not, there's one other thing. You didn't visit in prison. You were, I was sick and you didn't visit me. And said, therefore depart from me. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it un unto me. So you can see that our response to others actually determines our destiny. Collective destiny? Yes. Nations? Yes. Individually? Also. You can't have a nation without an individual. And it's what, it's what an individual does. And the, the congregate of that individual, those individual persons that determine the destiny of that person and of those persons. Now, a beginning faith is mixed and impure. I told you this was me. <laughs> this is no fault of the believer. 
The background of any person contributes to a beginning faith. For that faith is composed of genetic input and environmental acquisitions. We acquire things as we go along. That's why I prayed for the congregation and for the parents. That's why I recognize that not all come into a full faith at the same time. It may be that genetically they have not been given. That is, through their bloodline has not come the power of faith. God's able to do that too. He can reach right over in a communist society and, and save someone who's never heard the gospel. And Steve and I remember so well, and some of you, the reading of Pastor Wormbrand's book, when, uh, when, he, when Wormbrand read to a Russian soldier one day that, that uh, he got to the place of the crucifixion. And when he did, the soldier broke down and cried and cried and cried, wept and wept and wept. But what Pastor Wormbrand said, wait just a minute, sir, that's not all. And then he read the story of the resurrection, after which the Russian soldier jumped and hollered and yelled and, and de declared himself joyful. Actually took place. See, God made a believer out of a man who had never heard the gospel, but a man through the Holy Spirit had been convinced and convicted and changed by the wonderful grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I've mentioned genetic input. I've mentioned environmental acquisitions. But now listen to this. Now, just because it's me that's doing most, um, near all the writing this morning doesn't mean this is not valid. I, I've been taught by some people who know. I, I have read after some people who know. So it's, it's my experience and what I've been taught and what Jesus has witnessed to that goes into this message this morning. So listen, you're talking about genetic input. You're not responsible. You're talking about environmental acquisition. You're not responsible. So, so when you come to the place of a conversion, you come to, to an impure faith. Father and mother reacted a certain way. Along the way in the life of the family, instead of trusting Jesus, you saw the worry over finances. You saw the worry over this or that and the other. And, and you, you became fearful also. That's an impure faith. However, it is the uniqueness of every person exercising free will that determines the purifying and the purity of that faith. It has to do not with your background as to its purity, but what you do with it. Dr. Michael used to say to us, I believe Harvard's greatest psychologist would say to us as we were privileged to have him as a professor when he retired from Harvard at Anderson College, he would say, young men and women, you are not responsible for what you are up to the age of 16, but you are responsible for what you do with what you have been from the age of 16 on. Don't give me that excuse, he would say. Don't excuse yourselves. Your background can either be a blessing or a curse. It depends upon your uniqueness. That is the unique use of of your free will. What do you do with it? What will you do with it? Isn't this something? In free will, we find ourselves responding to trials and tribulations. Great trials and tribulations are to bring us to great joy. Count it all joy, James says. <laughs> When these things come upon you, because what are they to do? To give you a complete faith, to give you a perfect faith, so that you may not lack anything, as J.B. Phillips translates. Oh, that's great. So it depends what you do in free will as to whether that faith is purified. Here come the trials. Here come the tribulations. Here come the trouble. What are we going to do with it? We're going to rejoice because God has found us worthy to suffer for his name's sake. God has found us worthy to suffer for our own sake. Oh, the value of suffering. You think that Joe and David would be what they are today if Hillary had not suffered these many months and you think the joy would have been as great? Do you think that in, in trusting in God and through this time of suffering, do you think they would be half the people that they are? I, I think not. No one is what they should be or what they have become unless there's been trials and suffering and, and, and great trouble. But God selects 
and God permits and God leads and he guides to bring some persons to a greater faith that the rest of us may be very inspired. Have you thought of, have you thought of Hillary's going? Had she not died in the early afternoon of Sunday, it is, and it is not likely, and of course the funeral homes do not, they try not to do nothing on Sunday, anything on Sunday. All right, therefore her funeral time, her time of joy and celebration came for us on Wednesday. And have you thought how perfect the timing was? The Lord even witnessed that the wedding of uh, Salad Days were, was to be put up at three o'clock. And so I'm told as they made their exit, the hearse came with a casket and made its entrance and they crossed. And I said to Tom England, blessed be the name of the Lord. Doesn't matter where it's a funeral or a wedding, same glory, same joy, same peace, same God, same worship. And Tom shouted. What does it matter? I said, Tom, let them bring the funerals, let them bring the weddings, same Jesus, same joy, just let us keep on worshiping God, whatever it be. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful to respond, to be able in God's strength to respond, having relied upon him because that's the starting point of faith. Starting point of faith is a reliance upon God. By the way, Pastor Dave reminded me that faith is primarily a verb in the Bible and, and could be translated faithing. Faithing. Bob said that just before my lips said it. Faithing. It's active. And I said faith is active. Faith is active. Faith is active. Another thing I want to tell you, that in most all studies of the Old Testament use of faith, whether in the Septuagint or in the Hebrew, and it's stronger in the Hebrew, the idea of faith and works is not separate at all. It is so intertwined that it's no wonder that James said what he did. A man that would believe God would be humble. A man that would know the greatness of God would submit himself. Therefore, he submits himself to the Word of God. And so he hears and he obeys God. James is speaking against something that came into Christianity that was never there in Old Testament thought. Was never there. They never thought in terms of not obeying once you believe, you see. It, it's only us that find ourselves trying to do like devils. Believe and, not, and uh, we're trying to do something else. We're trying to believe and not tremble. We're trying to believe and not tremble. We're, we're trying to believe and have no fear, no reverence, uh, which is shown forth in our ob obedience to the commands of Christ. So, in, in uh, choice, we respond, and we respond, and we actually welcome. Now, we don't pray troubles upon us. But when God designs our life so that we may have them, by God's grace, we respond with joy because it's doing something great in our life. Then, in free will, we obey God. And 1 John 2, 5 tells us what happens to us. I've used this before, but it's, it comes up now perfectly. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. This is why it's so important, dear ones, that you and I do what God tells us to do. Whether it is a weekend visit or the staying of a weekend visit or whether it's a trip to the Holy Land or a home, whether it's a certain school or whether it is marrying the, that person that God intends for us, whatever, in that obedience, we, we unmix our faith. In that obedience, we come to a perfect faith. And it's also important to be in the right location. To be in that location means where God wants you to be means that God is able to, to and has designed for us in that place all things that are necessary for our happiness and all things that are necessary for our pure faith. Now, here we're trying to come to happiness and oftentimes we've not realized that the trials and the tribulations are designed to bring us to the very happiness that we so often long for. Because we cannot be happy, truly happy, while our faith is so mixed. And as these things are burned from our life, we found that we had everything to be happy for all along. 
and we just didn't realize it because we had covetousness or we had something that was not quite balanced in our life, and God accepted us just as we are. I love the old song, don't you do? See, you don't have to get started anywhere. You just come like you are. You, you can come backslidden. You can come perverted. You can come uh, uh, gross sinner. You can come the chief of sinners like Paul himself. It doesn't make a difference how you are. You can get started right there. He will accept you at the point that you know that he is God and that you are nothing and that in the point that you're entirely willing to rely upon, you've got a good start right there. But now it's in the sanctification that we hesitate because that has to do with others. In the first place, others will reveal what we are not. They'll tell us what we are not. Oh, if it just weren't for my wife, I could surely live a Christian life. Nonsense. It's because of your wife that God has enabled you uh, to become a true Christian or husband or some other obnoxious person. <laughs> See, we, do, we look at it wrong. We got the thing backwards. Even if we marry the wrong person. And I don't know why any of us should ever look back and make such an examination. Because once we've committed ourselves to a person according to the Bible... Divorce is not, is not to be even considered. Now, it, it can happen, and we mustn't judge others because God, and someone told me one day, I think I told you this, he said, well, God doesn't believe in divorce. I've had that said to me by irate husbands more times than I'd like to think about it. And I have had the courage sometimes to say to that person, my friend, you don't know the Bible. God tells me that he'll divorce me if I don't stay true to him. Don't give me that nonsense. What you're trying to say to me, what you want me to do is yank a collar around your wife's neck or vice versa around the husband's neck and yank him in and make him live under your awful, your awful iron rule. Tell me God doesn't believe in divorce. The Bible's filled with it. And God warns us that he'll divorce us. He said, I'll divorce you. But his perfect, his perfect plan is neither for your divorce nor for our divorce from his spiritually. Now that enlightens us a bit, don't you think? Whenever the wife or the husband finds it so hard they can't stay with you any longer and they have to leave, for goodness sakes, don't come to me and say God doesn't believe in divorce. Why, well, he sure full well does. It's just not his perfect will. May be his secondary will. May be a half to, but he certainly believes it not. Now wouldn't that help a lot of people if I could get that point across to them? Come and give me these things to put a yoke around people's necks make them do uh, uh, things or make them get them under the grit and grind of, a, of carnal personalities. Uh, I'm not for that and Jesus is not for it either. You know, Jesus had a time with that woman. I don't know what word he did with her. He says, who are you living with? And, or who's your husband? <laughs> she said, I have none. He said, you sure answered right because you've had six. Now answer me a question. What one do you send her back to? Unless you just take it for granted the first is dead. Now you've really got some problems on your hands. Listen, it presented him no problem. All she had to do in loving the Savior, and remember, he started revival there in Samaria from a woman. He started out of a woman believing who had had six husbands. Those Samaritans must have been mighty humble. She runs back in there and she said, oh, she said, I found the Messiah. I, he told me all that I ever did. Somebody said, you mean he's told about how you've been living all these years? Yeah, he told me that too. <laughs> now, what else did he say? Well, he said he's going to give me living water. I've already got a taste of it. Come and see. I tell you, they went from door to door and here they came and he stayed with them more than one day. The Savior himself did. Isn't that wonderful? So great. But the testing of some others in that village came when they, were, when they found themselves to require, required to accept her without reservation and as if she had never had but one or two husbands and to treat her as if she had had zero because she was now clear. And to the woman caught in adultery, his words are so precious, so wonderful. Go and send them. Woman, where are thine accusers? I have none, Lord. I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. Oh, what a great God we have. 
See, he starts with us at any point. He starts with us in adultery. He starts with us uh, um, if we have multiple marriages. He starts with us if we have repeated offenses. It doesn't make any difference. We can be a murderer, and he starts with us. Or a murderer, multiplied time. He starts with us at the time that we're willing to acknowledge him for what he is and to completely rely upon his wonderful love. So obedience is that which purifies our faith. And then there's something else that's a part of our attitude, and it's found in 1 John 3, 3, and this is hope. This attitude is filled with hope. 1 John 3, 3 says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. I want you to look at the things I've talked about. I've talked about this attitude consisting of the welcoming of the trials that God sends us, the willingness to let God have his own way in our life providentially, the obedience to his revealed will, and a hopefulness. And that's a part of faith. You can't describe it without that. In all of this hope, in all of this obedience, in all of this willingness to be contented with what he brings our way, we find ourselves coming to a perfect faith. And we find ourselves coming to maturity. We find ourselves coming to joy. Faith is a feeling. Faith is an attitude. We need, dear ones, today the revelation of testing. The character of our faith is revealed in our response to those who are both rich and poor. It is revealed in our response. You remember the rich and the poor. It means the responding to them in the same way. Same love if they have jewels and plenty, same love. If they have nothing, same love. And if they have nothing, a willingness to provide or fill up that need that they have, if it's within your power to do so. He makes that clear. James makes that clear. All right? The revelation of testing involves responding or yielding to those who have authority over us. In fact, there ought to be in us such a willingness to be servants and to respond to authority you see, but if we run into a place where we're not, we have a good test. We have a good revelation for us. And uh, my father is the type of man who, he, who, who willingly places himself under authority. I mean, doesn't care, it doesn't matter to dad who it is. If he thinks they've got a little bit of authority, dad willingly places himself under that authority. He says, you know, do this, do that. Now, that is a godlike quality and it comes in the knowledge of God's everythingness and in the knowledge of our nothingness. Because in submitting unto God's everythingness, we submit to God's authority, both as to king, governor, president, and as to the order in our home, that's husband being the head of the household, and as to the authority of the pastor, and as to the authority of those that, we, that stand in relationship to our own position. Listen, tell your employer or tell those who have authority over you, say, please, please tell me when I'm wrong. Please let me know when you don't agree with what I'm doing. Make them, make them, make them your friends. And by the way, Always be willing to accept the smiting of a friend. Only a friend will smite you in, in, in true spirit. What I mean by that, I mean if we talk too loud, if our manners are substandard, if our speech is not correct, if our appearance is less than it should be, we should be willing, dear ones, or if we have something about us that's offensive, and you know people out there who do not love us, they're not going to tell us. What they do is stick up their nose at us. And they say bad things about us. But a friend who's close enough and should be close, but a friend, that's what a true friend is. A friend should be able to tell us. What if we hadn't had mothers and fathers to tell us to use the older? You think anybody's going to accept your message of the gospel? If you smell bad, not likely. You don't want to smell bad unless God is designed for you to smell bad. 
And I, I doubt if even John the Baptist smelled that way. Even though he wore camel hair and what he did. But if you don't have a good pleasantness about your person, why, you're going to resent somebody for telling you so? If you have a sour smell, somebody ought to be kind enough to tell you somewhere along the line. Yet, most of us resent. We resent speech correction. We, we, we resent correction on appearance. We resent all of these things. When these things are designed to make our message, the gospel of the good news, acceptable to someone else. And without that acceptability, I mean, without them accepting our person, they will not accept our message. How is God going to do it? How is he going to take the offensiveness out of our character? How is he going to take our unmixed faith and make it pure? He's going to do it in, the, in some hard trials and tribulations. And that should, be, that should start while we're children, and it should start at times when the switch is laid to our flesh, or in some manner where discipline restrains us, and the parent is saying, that's wrong, that's wrong. It's not acceptable. It does not reflect what God intended for you to be. We need to judge ourselves or be judged. The true attitude toward God is tested by circumstances and by people, but primarily by people. Before I read this last statement, let me, let me say this. No, I'll go right into it, I guess. Well, let's put it this way. I just thought of something, and I want to share it with you before I've concluded here. Something that I've shared before, but it's more serious than what I first presumed. Reverend Helm has shared with us that our faith in God, our love for God, rises no higher than our faith that our love for the least of persons. And I have been tempted to think of persons who are offensive. And then I realize there's a greater offensiveness. And the greater offensiveness is this. The more godlike a person is, the more least he is. See, the more godlike a person is, the more that he trusts in God, the more God changes his life, the more that person is hid, and the more that person reflects God. And I have found, dear ones, that our offensiveness is not so much tested at the Offenses, the social offenses between each other, not so much tested at that point as it is tested at the godly in the kingdom who are truly the least. There's where our offensiveness comes. There's where the test of our true faith is revealed. When you really have somebody who's doing God's will, when you really have someone who's reflecting the love of God, how do you respond to them? That person who is truly least in the kingdom or becoming least, who truly knows that he is nothing, <clears throat> it is our response to them that, by which God measures our love. Why? Because more of God's revealed in their life than in somebody else's life. So, you see, it's not the social outcast. And yet, that very much is a part of our testing because he said, visit the widows and the orphans, that is, uh, give practical kindness to the unprotected members of your Christian society or of society in general. That's why we have some of the laws and some of the helps that we have in our society because we've recognized that responsibility. But my dear ones, your bigger test is in your attitude toward the godlike. Your attitude toward those who are walking with God, who are like Christ in your home, who are like Christ in the church, and who are like Christ in the community. That is an accurate test of your feeling toward God. That's why, dear ones, that I've always believed, stood by, supported, never doubted, always tried to be faithful to a man by the name of Lauren Ham, because I found him to be godlike. And I found, I, 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 I'm like Pilate, I find myself asking the question, uh, how can I be offended with him? I find no fault in him. It's not that I don't find him be human. It's just that I find such a beauty of holiness, such a beauty of God, that I am so startled with that, that I find myself reacting to the God that is within him. The great, the great revelation, maybe it was great, it was for me, for me came in 1973, 
when I found out that as God would change me through trials and tribulations and persecutions and through circumstances, primarily through people, and as I responded with good attitude toward those changes, toward those criticisms, accepting many things, most all, I trust, of the criticisms that were given to me and trying to be careful with my walk before God, I found myself at a point where I realized that people were not being upset with me at all. But wherever the Lord came through, that they found, they found themselves upset with him. And then I came to this point. I said, oh God, do I really want to be like you? You mean this is why the world's upset? You mean, I said, Jesus, you mean why this is the, why the religious world's upset? This is why the preachers are persecuting me, not over me. I'm no threat to anybody. But if I obey the living Christ, and if I obey the living God, I'm a threat to people because they're facing the greatest power in the world. And if you're on the same road together in the obedience of God, everything's fine. But if you're running at counter purposes, everything's not fine. And brother, the self assertiveness and the carnality will rise up. Now, I want you to know that John call, James calls us in his letter, he calls us beloved brethren, but he also calls us adulteresses. The same thing, same man, addressing the same people. Why is he doing this? Because he's dealing with a church that has accepted, accepted double-mindedness. He's dealing complementary with their faith, and he's dealing with the hatred of God that is within them in a way as to call it what it is. And he's saying, brother, when you run off and do what God doesn't want you to do, you're an adulterer. Brother, whenever you're involved in what God doesn't want you to do, you're an adulterer, you're an adulteress. See, it's in spiritual terms. The actual uh, thing of the body doesn't upset him so much as, it, as that spirit that gives into people who make a confession and do not follow ways and yet walk where you want to walk and not obey God. James will look you in the face. And he'll say, you are an adulterer. We've been so hard we can't hear it anymore. We have heard and heard and heard. And with every hearing where we do not obey God, we become harder. We can sit here and get halfway blessed because the Spirit of God is working in our midst. But we can't hear the preacher say, Oh, thou adulterer, repent! Thereby we never put aside the, adult, the, the double mind. We never put aside the hatred of God that is within us when it comes to making that price, borrowing that money, doing what God wants to do, find ourselves, we find ourselves restrained by the carnal nature because the carnal mind is enmity against God, cannot be subject to the law of God, and can never be. God has mercy enough upon us to call us beloved brethren and then to direct his thoughts toward us. And see, the church world isn't like this. Make, if they don't, they're not the church. God can only eliminate double-mindedness in the church. The world's not double-minded. It's single-minded about doing its own business. It's the church that's double-minded. It's the work of sanctification that God's want to work. He wants to get out of us that which hates Him. Because at a crucial moment when all that's coming to us in life that God wants to come to us, you and I make the choice of flesh and it's gone. We won't marry the right person. We won't go to the right college. We won't go to the right location because it seems too hard. Somebody's allowed that carnal nature, mostly our own self, to stay within us. We've made the choice of flesh. Till the testing time comes, we can't go, we can't step for God. Faith, my friends, is a feeling. It's an attitude toward God. Am I going to let Him run my life or am I going to run it myself? Faith is an attitude toward God of such complete trust, we find ourselves perfectly contented at any given moment and always thanking God. That's true faith. That's true spirituality. God designs these things for us and we find ourselves being discontent. God permits these things to come our way to develop our character for a work that He has for us and we resent it. We tell everybody we're, not just, we're just hanging on by a thread. We're just barely making it because God loves us. My God, may He forgive us for our words. My God, may He deliver us. May He wholly devastate us until we're willing to know that we're safe in the Master's hand. Held by far more than a single thread. Held by the mighty power and God's great grace. 
None of you, neither you nor I, are holding God by a thread. My friends, he's got us wrapped around, and he's got glory all the way through. Trials and troubles and tribulations are designed to bring us to God to break down this awful thing that came through our parents and our grandparents and that we acquired when we went our own way as children and our own way as teenagers and our own way as the young adults when we've been doing our own thing most all the time, just getting God's work done long enough to feel a bit appeased. Or he might be a bit pleased with us. No, sir, my friend. No, sir. Say, Brother Hogue, who are you talking to? Well, myself primarily. Because I've had such a feeling sometimes that I just had a thread. Wow, such a lie. My dear ones, I'm supported by the everlasting arms of Almighty God. I may have a mixed faith, but he's trying to unmix it. I may have a little faith, but he's trying to get me to be like the woman who had great faith who would accept even the crumbs from the master's table. I may be of a person of uncompleted faith, but he's trying to perfect it. He's trying to get the job done in my own life. Now, God's given you what you wanted. Some of you like quiet preaching. I did that for about half the time, three-quarters of the time, and some of you like it a little louder. I gave you that too. Primarily because the Holy Ghost stirred up my breast. True spirituality. My, we're going to have to be grateful for what God's done for us. I'm going to have to be grateful for bringing me to Scott Depot. I'm going to have to be grateful for the time when I was near death. I'm going to have to be grateful for all the preachers who came against me. I'm going to have to be grateful for the misunderstandings, for my, fel my fellowship in these things, or my fellowship with Christ. I know what he feels like, at least to a bit, a bit. I know what a bit what he feels like. I'm going to have to be grateful for that which is taken away from me that I think I need, that I might be so burned up in the crucible of fire that what comes out is pure gold and unalloyed. Lord, I'm going to have to be grateful. James is saying, be grateful. James is saying, God's trying to make you courteous to all, compassionate to all, and consistent with all. In order to do it, he's going to put you right through the time of testing. Won't you hold still long enough to be what God wants you to be? Won't you be thankful in the place of testing? Do you know that you're where God wants you to be? Then be grateful for everything he designs for your life. Faith is a feeling. It's an attitude toward God. And Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God, may we be able to see through our own scars and our own wounds something that Thomas saw in his, that we do indeed have a Lord, that we do indeed have a God. And he's doing right well. We may not be responding right well, but he's doing wonderful. Are you with me? If I could give you a perfect example, I'd probably be too holy to preach and too holy to touch. I can't do that. I've often thought when Brother Helm told me of how in uh, that precious city, when he was, people wanted to burn his house down, wanted to throw rotten eggs at him. And he had such joy and he had such love for everybody. <clears throat> 1973, I knew that I had no hate. In 1974, 1975, but I can't say that I was very exuberant about the pain. And I've always been sorry over that. And I'm still sorry over it. And I don't like anybody to excuse it in my life. I pray that in this day, I would have been more happy than I was in those early days when the fires of testing were, to my own person, so severe. I didn't have any resentment, but I, didn't, I just couldn't exercise the joy. Now, there's times when I hit a level that the joy would be so great that I hardly knew what to do with myself. But having the weight of lost property and all of that, I, I couldn't sometimes distinguish between care and responsibility and with... Uh, accepting things that were, I was not supposed to accept. I admire God's servant for the way that he responded. I'm reminded that the Holy Spirit did a work within him in a few weeks, taking out some 30 to 40 things out of him, wrath and many things. I only thank God that he was willing to submit to the awful dying that took place in his own life. 
I am begging us not in just a matter of weeks to respond to that testing, that design of God, but I'm begging us to respond to a matter of a lifetime because you and I have a good unit worked out for us almost 15 years now. Some of us have been together, some of us less than that, but it's a good unit nevertheless. May God Almighty help us to appreciate what he's, done, what he's doing with our lives. May God Almighty help us to count it all joy when, my friend, the very thing that you and I need, the very thing that you and I long for is coming to pass but cannot be completed unless you and I get happy about it, unless you and I embrace this cross and that's what it is and cherish this which most people do not. That cross on Calvary, I don't care for your tears, my friends. Weeping over that old cross that got rid of everybody's sins, potentially. Unless you're weeping over the same one that's working in your life right now. Through a wife or a husband or children or congregation or friends or community or friend or foe. If you're weeping over that one, that is weeping over what God's doing with you under the pressure, then I'm impressed with your tears over Calvary. Otherwise, leave them out of the way. They're crocodile anyway. Until we embrace that cross in the interior life, the cross we give, come to him in true faith, we do take a cross. We do deny ourselves. We do take up a cross and we follow him. And great is the joy in our life. Yes, even as we're burned up along the way. In fact, greater is that joy. You've heard Oliver's sermon. You say, preacher, I don't like Oliver's sermon. I don't believe you should say that. Paul said my gospel, and I'm a follower of Paul. If you don't like that, you don't like Paul. I simply have given you my heart in summation of these preachings on James, begging earnestly beseeching you and myself that we present our bodies a living sacrifice for the sake of ourselves, for the sake of God Almighty and our, what we're created for and for the sake of others, including Israel herself, himself. Praise God. Shall we stand?